Heavenly Father, Lord, we can never pray too much. So, Father, we come before you again this morning. In a time in this country, Lord, where things are becoming unraveled, things are not just happening here, but all over the world. Lord, we need you more now than ever. So, Lord, as we come to you, we know before we even ask the question, you have the answer. So, Father, we come to you asking that you would bless us with your presence. Fill us, each one, with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us, Father, from on high. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Is this this mic that's doing this here? Did you turn this on? You did turn it on. Okay. You know, um, our country, even the world, is poised on the precipice of eternity. And things are happening so quickly, and we're told that things would happen. The, the last movements, we're told, would be rapid ones. And we see things happening um, at neck break speed. And this morning, I want to deal with the, the subject that is so obvious to all of us. Um, I love history. I love it more now than I did when I was in school, especially when I was in college. I wish I loved it as much as I did then that I do now. Perhaps I would have been able to finish. And uh, anyway, I love history, and the Bible is a book full of history. So the things that we're dealing with now, they're not new. Things that we see, in fact, Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, what has happened before will happen again. So I want to deal with this situation from a biblical perspective. America, our country, was actually uh, born with a congenital defect, if you will. Um, not spinal bifida or cleft palate or some of those childhood diseases. My mom was born with a heart murmur. And it always you know, amazed the doctors anytime she was in the hospital. Uh, and they would take their stethoscopes and listen to her murmur. Uh, see, they would ask my mother, do you mind if, if some of these interns would, can, can they come and listen to your heart? And my mom, being the woman that she would, was, uh, said, oh, no, I don't mind. And they would take their stethoscopes one after another and listen to her heart. And they could hear the, whoosh, 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 the whistling as the blood pumped through the hole in her heart. Uh, it was a congenital defect. America's congenital defect is racism. This country was founded from that. And uh, we do not do ourselves any favors by ignoring it. Um, in order for us to get through what we're dealing with now, conversations have to be had. They must be had. And for some, these conversations are rather uncomfortable, difficult to have. However, as difficult as they are, they must be had. Jesus himself came here to discomfort the comfortable and to comfort those who were discomforted. And so today we need to deal with things a little bit, but let's look at it from the biblical perspective. I love the story that's in John chapter 4. If you open your Bibles to that chapter right now, John chapter 4. You know, you will not come across anything on this planet that has not been addressed within Scripture at some point in time. This story here in John chapter 4 is usually entitled, The Woman at the Well. This woman that, uh, was at, that came to the well, she was a Samaritan. You all know the story well. Jesus had left uh, Judea and was heading back to Galilee. Between Judea and Galilee was the region of Samaria. As he was heading to uh, Galilee, around 12 o'clock noon, the Bible says around the sixth hour, he found himself weary and thirsty. So Jesus went and he sat 
at a well. It's called Jacob's Well. While his disciples went into town to purchase food, Jesus sat there at the well. And around 12 o'clock noon, a lady came with a pitcher to draw water. It's a little bit unusual for this lady to be coming at this time because normally women went first thing in the morning because it was nice and cool to draw water. But this was somewhat of an unusual woman as well. As Jesus sat there at the well, and this woman, almost not even noticing him, saw or began to do the thing that she came there for to get water. As she was about to leave, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The woman was somewhat startled a little bit because Jesus was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. To put that in our today's language, Jesus was a Hatfield, and she was a McCoy. All right. She was startled by Jesus asking her for a drink because the Bible says Jews and Samaritans have nothing to do with one another. There was a racial divide between these two peoples. Sound familiar? So I love the way we were told our Jesus was so artful in dealing with people. He knew that if somehow he would have offered her a favor, it could have been and probably would have been rejected. So he did the opposite. He asked her for a favor. Now in the Middle East, water is called the gift of God. And the Arabs on the desert you know, felt it was an obligation to give someone that was thirsty a drink. They would go out of their way to get a drink for someone uh, that was thirsty. So this woman asked Jesus, how is it that you being a Jew asked me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? You know as well as I do, Jesus, Jews and Samaritans are like oil and water. We do not mix. She was perplexed. So Jesus said to her, if you knew who it was that you were talking to, you would have asked me for a drink, and I would have given you a special kind of water. Now, it, it wasn't that puree. I'm sure it probably wasn't this. Uh, we have a, 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 some water in the icebox. I don't even know. It might even be on my bottle called Niagara. I said Niagara. And uh, I don't know what type of water uh, was in that well, but, you know, uh, Jesus wanted a drink of water. But he told this woman, if you only knew who was talking to you, you would have asked me for some water, and I would give you a special water. And she looked the situation over, and she says, well, how could you possibly do that? It's obvious you don't have anything to draw with it. The well is deep. So as this conversation went on, she said, sir, give me that water. Jesus said to her, okay, I'll give it to you. Go get your husband and bring him here. She said, well, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a husband, sir. Jesus said, well, you told the truth with that one. The man you're living with is not your husband. But you had five. The woman was shocked. Totally shocked, George. How could this man possibly know this about me? Oh, sir, I perceive that you must be a prophet. Knowing this thing, she wanted to do what so many politicians do today. She tried to pivot, change the subject, redirect the conversation. She said, sir, you know, uh, my, my ancestors say that um, it's in this other city, Gerizim is where we should worship. But you Jews, you say we are to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said, you know, the hour is coming where you will neither worship in that place or any other place. But the Father is seeking those who will worship him, how? In spirit and in truth. You know, I love the way Jesus dealt with this situation. He let the woman go on for a little ways, but he was in control. He was completely in control of this thing. He had a mission to accomplish. And that mission was to share the gospel with this 
young lady who was living openly in sin. So as they continued on, Jesus did what we should be doing today. That's why the, t the sermon is titled WWJD. What would Jesus do? I started to title it, What Did Jesus Do? Because it's what we need to be doing today, especially now in this time of turmoil, in this time of racial tension. Jesus, being a Jew, engaged this woman being a Samaritan. Now, if we put ourselves in this situation, what does that tell us we should be doing? We need to be talking to people that are different than us. We need to be having conversations that might be somewhat uncomfortable for some of us. But this thing is not going to get better simply by ignoring it. It's not going to happen. In fact, you know, personally, um, I, I think that we are poised more just on the, the, the threshold of, of eternity. We are knocking on the very end of time. This is my personal belief. We're told that things are going to happen. We know these things are going to happen. The love of many, the Bible said, would do what? Wax cold. We see this happen on a regular basis. People are angry. The nations are angry. Personally, I think we're at a tipping point. This is not going to go away. I don't know how many days it is now that people have been protesting, but I'll tell you this, I have never been more proud as an American than to see what I am seeing today. You see, I've watched, I was born in 1958, and I remember though at 10 years old, the riots that took place in Watts. I remember the things that happened after the assassination of Martin Luther King. I remember the Detroit riots. I remember many of the things that I watched and saw on television. Many of you saw the same things. We're seeing those things today. But one of the key differences today is that I see my young white brothers and sisters out protesting. I see a, 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 a tapestry of colors all marching together. Now, mind you, these people in the midst of a pandemic are risking their lives because they have had enough. They've had enough. And I don't think that we can take the chance of thinking that this will simply pass, even though there have been George Floyd situations, even since George Floyd. Things are happening. But the difference is all colors of people are joining together and saying enough is enough. I don't know personally what it is or what it was about this particular incident that has galvanized people to where this plethora of colors have united in raising their voices against this injustice. I, I don't know exactly what was so different about this situation because there has been situation after situation after situation after situation, but something clicked in the psyche of Americans this time. Something clicked. And now I see white and black and red and brown, all the colors of the rainbow, so to speak, laying on the ground for eight minutes and 46 seconds, saying I can't breathe. I have never been more proud to see this. I personally had sent out videos to some individuals in, in this church. And I asked a question. And the question that I asked was simply this. Why hasn't someone, in particular someone white, from my church made the statements or join the protest, and maybe some of you have, I don't know. Why is it some of God's people have not felt or expressed, I should say, the rage and the anger of seeing this brutal event take place? 
you know, I looked at this, and, I, and, and I'll tell you this honestly. I'm not going to say any names. But some of the responses that I got back were a surprise to me. They were a surprise to me. Some of the responses that I got back were not what I expected. And I, I, I was in deep conversation with our God. Because, see, this is what I believe. I believe that Jesus was an activist. Jesus came and he dealt with social injustices. Jesus is the best example of what we should be doing. And this is what he was doing at the well with this woman. He was interacting with someone totally different of him. And I am so, you know, if we just unpack this thing for a minute, look what happened with this. Not one word of denunciation did he say to this woman. He had to deal with her sin. He had to deal with that because he is the Savior. So he did deal with that, but he did deal with it in a very loving way, right? Almost to me it was kind of uh, humorous. He said, you know, well, yeah, you told the truth about this, my sister. You know, you, you, you're not married now, but you've been married five times. You know, I look at what he did, and I said, you know, we cannot learn from a better teacher in how to deal with this thing that we're dealing with now in this country. You, we cannot simply sit back and do nothing. You know, I, 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 I was researching some things. Things were running through my mind all week long. You know, there's a quote that's attributed to a, a man by the name of Edmund Burke. Are you familiar with that name, Edmund Burke? Well, you'll be more familiar with the quote. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. To do nothing. We cannot sit back and do nothing. You cannot sit back and do nothing. There is more at stake here than just this, 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 uh, immediate turmoil that you see going on in the country, much more at stake. I could hear my father saying, what, did you not see a cause? You know, I'm reminded of, of, of what you hear the, the, the grandkids asking the grandparents, what did you do during the war, daddy or grandpa? And you hear those things being asked to you today. What did you do during this upheaval? upheaval? What did you do? You know, I was reminded of so many different things in the scripture, you know, about the talents, you know, the talents that were given and, and the individual that took and buried his talent. And, you know, we have so many things that are in scripture that, that lend to these type of situations, don't we? God has given each one of us talents. We have a voice. You know, I look at it this way. To see what is happening today and to see what has been happening for generations and to step forward and do nothing but to just go on living our lives because it's not affecting me is tantamount to being a person saying, I'm a Christian, but I don't, do, I don't practice Christianity. Does that make sense? I'm a Christian. I believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. However, I don't practice Christianity. See, because I heard all different types of verbiage that had come back to me. I'm, a, I'm not a racist, but, but see, that's not good enough anymore. We, Jesus put it this way, you are either with me or you're against me. You cannot simply stand idle, poised in what we call spiritual Switzerland, a neutral ground. You can't do it. Some say if you don't stand for something, you don't stand for anything. And if we see evil and we do not speak out, what will be written in the books of heaven about us? We have to get involved because we are involved. You know, they, they, they talk about wars. We have been involved, involved in, the, in the, the, the most serious war for the longest time, some of us may not know it, 
But there are spiritual battles that are, that are going on. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities in, 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 in high places. We are involved. And we have to take a stand. We have to be willing to do something. Some of us have a privilege that others don't have. And to have that privilege and to not use that privilege or that platform or whatever you want to call it, well, I think it speaks for itself. You know, uh, I'm, I'm reminded, you know, Martin Luther King took and he paraphrased a quote from a man by the name of Theodore Parker. Are you familiar with that name, Theodore Parker? He was a, he was a transcendentalist and a, a, a Unitarian pastor, minister. And, and Martin Luther King paraphrased from a sermon that he gave in 1853. Martin Luther King put it this way. The moral, the moral arc of the universe is a long one, but it bends towards justice. That's not exactly how Theodore Parker put it. You can Google it and go read it for yourselves. But the gist of it is pretty much the same. The problem with that is it almost leans to the, to, the, to, the, to the ideology that if, you know, things will take care of themselves. If you just leave it alone, uh, things will work themselves out. They will not. We have to take a stand. We have to get involved. We that call ourselves by his name cannot sit back idly and say this doesn't really involve me. America will heal together or it will burn together. You see, I look at things and I love history. I, I, I got some comments about, you know, immediately not, not wanting to address what caused these protesters to get out there, but want to focus in on the looting. That's deflection. That's deflection. Because, see, I know that some folks never said anything. Maybe they didn't know. You ever heard of Black Wall Street? You ever heard of Black Wall Street? Anybody raise your hand? Black Wall Street? Tulsa, Oklahoma? Don't know anything about it. Hundreds of black people were killed, shot, and murdered simply for wanting to have the, uh, the, 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 the mitigated gall, the audacity to want to rise up above. Murdered. And no one talks about it. But folks like to point to the negative and say, well, look at this, as if almost to excuse the injustice that got these people out there. Shame on us. We have to deal with these things. And we as God's people, it, it, it's more than what meets the eye with this. We just can't say, well, you know, I've got my salvation. This really doesn't have anything to do with me and my salvation. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because we will be asked, what did you do? What did you do? You know, I, I, I've been waiting for someone just to call me and say, you know what, this is, you know, to express some type of rage, some type of, you know, say something to me. Maybe we're not family enough. Maybe we don't feel comfortable enough with each other. You can do that. I, I give you permission right now today. Call me. I'm black. Did you notice? You can call me. Talk to someone that's different than you. We need to talk to other people. But see, right now in this country, what people have done, they have gone to their prospective corners or their prospective Democratic or Republican parties. And they only listen to the news sources that reinforce what they already believe. They'll listen to Fox News or they'll listen to the CNN News or the National News or whatnot, only to reinforce what they already believe. Propaganda stations, really, what some of them have become. Talk to your Father in Heaven. Get your marching orders from Him. Get your marching orders from God. He will not steer you wrong. You know, I'm reminded that, that you, know, you know, what's happening now is there are people that are surrounding power that are trying to implement policies and whatnot that they feel would be for the good of the country, but they don't realize that, that God said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. There are people trying to do by legislation and policies that which can only be done by the Holy Ghost. 
working from the inside out. And God expects us. I would like you to do something today. Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22. We're not going to go into that today. You know, not now. The time won't permit it. But you have all day today and go and read Jeremiah chapter 22. And if you have problems with the these and the thous and whatnot, read it from the New International Version or from the uh, New Living Translation, whatever, so that you grab the whole gist of it because it is a snapshot of what we're dealing with in this country right now. Right now. And if you want to be right with God, according to Jeremiah chapter 22, to be right with God is to take care of the foreigners, the widows, the fatherless. In other words, Jesus meant it when he said, wherein you have done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. Wherein you have kept your silence and you have not opened your mouths and you have not spoken out about what has happened to me or to them, he says, you've done it to me. This thing is personal. It's very personal. And Jesus takes it personal. That's what he means when he says, wherein you have done it or not done it, to the least of these, you've done it to me. Whatever you do, good or bad, to whoever you do it to, or whatever you don't do, good or bad, Jesus said, why did you do that to me? Why did you do that to me? Why didn't you do that to me? See, this is only a microcosm, so to speak. You know, it, it, you, we, we have to understand, we have to start at a place to have these conversations, and you have to have a conversation from an intelligent point of view. You have to know history somewhat. Same as with Christianity. You have to know the history of the gospel. You have to know the history of the church. You're not going to be a very effective tool in the hands of God if you don't know. My Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a command to study. My Bible says, be prepared to give to anyone who asks you an answer or a reason for why you have this hope within you. Am I misquoting scripture? We need to know. We need to know. We are engaged in a serious, serious battle for the soul of this country. And I personally, I believe we have gone past the point. And I say that only because of this. The Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There is no program that we can implement. There is no policy that we can implement that will, that will, will, will heal what ails us. There's only one that I know who can do that. His name is Jesus. I don't look for no person, no Biden, no Trump, no anyone else to get into the White House and to fix what's going on. I look to who is sitting on the throne, not who's sitting in the White House. That's all that matters. But even more so, what matters is who is really sitting on the throne of your hearts. Who are sitting, who is sitting on the thrones of your hearts? Is the one who said, Lord, 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 you know, in your name we did these things, and in your name he said, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then do not what I say do? That's Jesus' way of saying, I am the boss of you. He says, if you love me, obey me, keep my commandments. This is how all men will know that you are my disciples. You have loved one for another, but we have allowed ourselves to be played, to be polarized into political camps. We've allowed ourselves to be polarized. First and foremost, before you are anything else, even before you are an American citizen, you are a child of the Most High God. You are a child of the Heavenly King, and your Heavenly Father expects certain things from his children. You know, my Bible says that when he comes, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. Well, John chapter 4 shows what being like Jesus is all about. Jesus interacted with this Samaritan woman. He interacted. Do you? Do I? Have you? Will you? 
interact with someone different. You know, I watched something just this week. I was flabbergasted by it. A woman, a white lady, 45 years old, said, I am 45 years old, and I have never had a conversation with a person of color. And when they begin to talk, all the things that they're doing now together, oh, it just thrills my heart. It thrills my heart. But you know what? I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Right now, they're projecting that upwards of 200,000 people may die by September. You see, this is very personal to me because I have two of the underlying conditions that, that this virus is killing. Two of them. And what this virus has done, it, it has exposed the inequities that are in our system. But they're only, they're only uh, things that, that some people who haven't really been paying attention have just recently found out. Some of us have known these things all of our 62 years. And now some people are beginning to listen and say, huh, maybe there is, maybe there is a problem that we have to face. Maybe there, maybe there is something going on. We cannot bury our heads in the sand. We cannot simply go back to business as usual. We can't do it. I call heaven and earth to witness before you this morning. What would Jesus do? John chapter 4 shows you what he did. The greatest teacher that ever walked the earth. Just simply go and do what he did. How about that? Is that okay? Just simply go and do what Jesus did. Get out of your comfort zone. Even get on your knees and ask, Lord, what would you have me to do? Say the same thing Isaiah said. Here I am, Lord, send me. Don't think that somebody else is going to do it. We all have a stake in this. All of us. Every single one of us. Personally, I think that what's going to happen based on what's in the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to read you something. I'm going to let you go. But, but this is not to, this is not to, to frighten anyone. If we believe in this gift that God has given this people, then we cannot ignore the writings that have given, been given to us. Either we believe or we don't. There is no neutral ground with this either. But the testimonies are under attack even. I want to share something with you because I think that um, 200,000 people is quite light. This is from, uh, all of you, have you, you familiar with the last day events? This compilation, have you? Uh, okay. This is from Last Day Events, Chapter 2. The tempest is coming, and we must get ready for its fury by having repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will arise to shake terribly the earth. We shall see troubles on all sides. Thousands of ships will be hurled into the depths of the sea. Navies will go down, and human lives will be sacrificed by millions, not by thousands, by millions. Fires will break out unexpectedly, unexpectedly, and no human effort will be able to quench them. The palaces of earth will be swept away in the fury of the flames. Disasters by rail will become more and more frequent. Confusion, collision, and death without a moment's warning will occur on, great, on the great lines of travel. The end is near. Probation is closing. Oh, let us seek God while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In the last scenes of this earth's history, war will rage. There will be pestilences, plagues, and famine. The waters of the deep will overflow their boundaries, property, and life will be destroyed by fire and flood. We should be preparing for the mansions that Christ has gone to prepare for them that love him. And it goes on and on and on. 
200,000. Millions. Millions. If indeed we are poised on the threshold of eternity, this is going to happen sometime soon. Either she was right or she was wrong. You decide. I believe in the spirit of prophecy. We are going to look back on these COVID-19 days as the good old days. Oh, we will long for the good old days of COVID-19. We are going to see things that no generation has ever seen. Jesus said, a time is coming such as there has never been since there was a nation upon the earth. And I have to tell you this. I'm going to say it this way. What we have witnessed for generations happening to different groups of people will soon be coming down your street. It will be coming down your street. You will become the scourge of the earth. If you remain loyal to God, if you choose to continue being in a relationship with God, though the heavens fall, you will be the ones that will deal with what's coming. And this is all about relationship. If your relationship with Christ Jesus is not where it ought to be, make haste. Make haste. There's no time to lose. Get as much Jesus as you can possibly get. You know, the beautiful thing about Jesus is you can't OD on Jesus. You can't OD on Jesus, you know? Oh, Jesus is not an opioid that will take your life. You cannot OD on Jesus. You cannot get enough Jesus. We need as much Jesus as we can possibly get because it is coming. It is coming even more quickly than maybe we as Seventh-day Adventists, though we have been told these things, are expecting. So get to practice now. Get to practice now in confronting things and standing up for Jesus and being counted for Jesus. And if you lose your life for Jesus, don't worry about it. Jesus says, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. All he has to do is speak the word. All he has to do is say, Brett, wake up. Michael Pest says, his voice will roll through this earth like peals of thunder, and the dead in Christ shall wake up. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, the Bible says. You will either fall upon the rock and be broken, or the rock will fall upon you and ground you to powder. Your choice. So do what Jesus did. WWJD. What would Jesus do? What did he do? John chapter 4. Go and unpack that. Get on your knees and ask the Holy Ghost, Lord, break this down to me so I can get this right. So I can go out and do what you did, Lord Jesus, with that, with that this despicable Samaritan woman at the well. Get out of your comfort zones. Amen? You most certainly can. Dwell upon the earth. Amen. Amen. You know, the devil has been using divide and conquer since he started this sin thing in heaven. He divided heaven. Mind upon mind. He divided our parents in the garden. And he has divided people in America. And we've allowed him to do it. We have put our political parties and whatnot ahead of our religious convictions. It is not safe to do so. It is not safe. So with that, I just simply ask that you pray with me. Gracious Father, Lord, I'm asking you to bring discomfort to those who are comfortable and to bring comfort, Lord, to the peoples that have been for so long uncomfortable. They have been discomfortable. Lord, we need your guidance. We need your marching orders. You've given us our marching orders. All we need to do is get close to you and allow you to move our feet, to use our mouths, to use our hands. But first, Lord, fill our hearts with your love. Fill our hearts with your love, and then let it overflow, Lord. Let us not be found on the wrong side of this thing, Lord. 
the price would be far too high. Please help us, Lord. Fill each person here within the sound of my voice with your spirit. Help us, Lord, to realize this too shall pass. Jesus is coming soon. Lord, please help us to be ready when you come. Because it's in your name that we do pray. And all of God's children, all of God's children said amen and amen.